I want to give just a brief update. Um, I'm very thankful to report this morning that I went to the uh, surgeon last Monday, which was the six week mark since I had my surgery. And they said everything looks beautiful. Uh, everything is healing perfectly. So um, very thankful for that. Um, in 10 days, I'll be going back again. And at that point, they will uh, allow me to remove and get rid of the walker and go to a cane. And at that point also, I will be starting physical therapy. So I am thrilled about that. Uh, I will be able to drive my own car again, which I am, again, very, very happy about. So I want to thank everyone for your prayers, uh, for those that have helped at the ministry. I deeply appreciate it. Um, without you, I couldn't have done it. So I, I'm grateful for those that have assisted. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really grateful where, where the ministry is in, in orders and getting materials out. In the last month, uh, I wasn't even aware of it until this week. But um, I guess after I had had the surgery about five or six days after that, we had ordered about 40 cases of books from Harvest Time. And uh, I had completely forgotten, but about the first week of January, we ordered another 40 cases of books from Harvest Time. And then this week, we ordered another 40 cases of books. So uh, in the last month, i um, very thankful that uh, Jose is filling boxes so rapidly in the back that uh, when I look in that room off to the left in the fellowship hall, uh, Jose drains it, and so then it's my job to fill it again. So very grateful that books are going out of here because as I was giving a little talk yesterday on the radio, about why Truth Triumphant exists. Uh, that's why Truth Triumphant began, uh, and that's why Truth Triumphant exists today, is to use whatever, uh, whatever is at our disposal to use, be it books, DVDs, YouTube, mass mailing, radio programs, whatever it is, but to use those vehicles to share the three angels' messages with the world. And that's why we started, and that's still why we exist today. So just very grateful, very grateful. And that's the update I wanted to give you all. Let's go ahead and have prayer. Dear Father in heaven, you've been so faithful, you have been so good, you have been so merciful to all of us. We want to thank you today. We want to thank you for sending Jesus to this world. We want to thank you for his ministries in the sanctuary above. We just pray for the Holy Spirit to quicken our minds, to anoint our eyes today, that we would understand where we are and how much you want to prepare us for the times in which we live. So we pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to bless us to that end. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to 
look at something that we do about once a month, and that's to give a prophecy update. Uh, God willing, next Sabbath, um, I'm looking forward to getting back to the new series that we started uh, two weeks ago called Against All Odds. Uh, because a lot of people in Bible history have faced insurmountable difficulties, uh, impossible enemies that were so much bigger than they were. And somehow, through God's amazing grace, uh, they were able to conquer them. And we will continue that series next Sabbath against all odds. Well, about three weeks ago, on January the 6th, 2024, Pope Francis celebrated the Mass on the Solemnity of the Epiphany in St. Peter's Basilica. In his homily, Pope Francis spoke about the lack of unity that exists within the church. He spoke about love and stated that we need to abandon ecclesiastical ideologies that are dividing us. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> anything that divides us, anything that will create a unity, that's what Pope Francis is calling for. Instead, we are to find our true meaning of ecclesial vocation within the Holy Mother Church. So in the mind of Pope Francis, we need to get away from and give up and abandon anything that would cause there to be division. It's amazing that as Jesus went through his ministry, Jesus was a constant source of division. Because Christ declared very clearly that there was a truth of God in the Bible and that that had to be stood for. And so when Christ prayed in John chapter 17 for there to be unity among his children, it was always based on the platform of truth, eternal truth. So in the mind of Christ, unity and truth were never separated. But clearly, in the mind of Pope Francis, unity is to be gained at all costs. And ecclesiastical ideologies must be put away. Let go of our ideologies and follow him, is what Pope Francis is saying. We need to set out on this journey so that our faith will not be reduced to an assemblage of religious devotions or mere outward appearance, but will instead become a burning fire within us, making us passionate seekers of the Lord's face and witnesses to his gospel. Now again, this is Pope Francis three weeks ago. We need this in the church where instead of splitting into groups based on our own ideas, we are called to put God back at the center. Now it's fascinating that Pope Francis says we don't want to split into groups based on our own ideas. Is that what we would do? Do we split over our own ideas? Or do we understand that God has an absolute truth? In Pope Francis's mind, 
They're our own ideas. But based on the word of God, in light of Revelation chapter 14, they're not our ideas. They are God's eternal truth. We need to let go of ecclesiastical ideology so that we can discover the meaning of the Holy Mother Church. Ecclesiastical ideologies, ecclesial vocation, the Lord, not our own ideas or our own projects must be at the center. Fascinating to me. Does the Lord stand for anything? Does the Lord Jesus Christ stand for anything? Or in following the Lord, we simply give up all of our own convictions of truth and make the church the focal point. Let us set out anew from God. Let us seek from him the courage not to lose heart in the face of difficulties, the strength to surmount all obstacles, the joy to live in harmonious communion. You know, it's fascinating in studying the history of the Protestant Reformation. If a book that if you don't have it, it would be great for you to get it. It's called The Reformation and the Advent Movement by William Emerson. And in this book, Mr. Emerson shows clearly that after Luther in 1521 at the Diet of Worms, you then have Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland and William Tyndale in England, and the Towson brothers in Scandinavia. But folk, what happened at that pivotal point in the Reformation was Martin Luther and Zwingli and other initial reformers stopped protesting. Because to embrace further truth they would have to be in opposition to the local authorities. And Luther and Zwingli would not do that. So, folk, what happened was there were people who came along that some writers call the reformers' stepchildren who continued to reform until they were established solely on Bible truth, as it related to baptism, as it related to the Sabbath, as it related to the sleep of the dead. All of these teachings, friend, were identified and established in the 1520s, not by Luther and Zwingli, but by other reformers. So the early reformers continued to search and dig for Bible truth until all that they taught and believed was founded in the Word of God. Cody? I was going to say, and also, even the Sabbath issue came up at that time. Absolutely. A man very close to, to Martin Luther, actually the very man who went to, who originally the, the, the debate that was in Leipzig, that famous debate between Eck and Luther was actually really between this man and Eck, and Luther sort of stole the show when he decided to come along. The man's name was Karlstadt. Mm -hmm. And Karlstadt brought the truth of the Sabbath message to Martin Luther, and Martin Luther rejected that message. 
Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, I do think Martin Luther will be in the kingdom because the Lord, the Lord, it's like what Jesus said to his disciples. There are many things I want to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. And uh, everything that Luther had done up to that point, the Lord said, okay, it's enough. Unfortunately, Cody, too often as human beings, we look today and we say, Luther had the light on the Sabbath. Luther had the light on the state of the dead. Luther had the light on the truth about baptism. And so what we do is we read into that and say, because he rejected those truths, therefore he was outside of God's grace. And that's just not true. It's just not true. And... I see the same mentality. Luther was coming out of a dark age where he was discovering so many gems of truth, but there were some he just couldn't grasp. And God allowed him to go to sleep. And in the 19th century, another man who was raised up by God by the name of William Miller, William Miller was blind to certain truths, the Sabbath truth. What was going to happen in 1844? We, we can't take the fact that these mighty reformers, Luther, William Miller, came out of such darkness, couldn't see certain things. We can't judge them and say, they're lost because they didn't see the advancing truth that we see today. Can't do that, Cody. Got to be very careful. Or the reverse, where people say, well, since they didn't have to do it, I don't do it. There you go. That's what Michelle. I was going to add about William Miller, the same, same scenario, but Ellen White says that it was his friends that led him astray. I mean, and he didn't see that light, and she, and that, that the Lord is, putting it on the friends and just let William go to sleep because he, so yes, he, he'll be in the kingdom. He did such a great work. It's just his friends that influenced him so much. Absolutely, Michelle. Appreciate that. Paul, go ahead. You know, I know you, you, you don't, you're, you're not wanting to go where this is going, but um, what you're saying is so true. Luther, his main thing and what the Lord used was righteousness by faith. That was Luther's thing, because he thought that the church, the, and this is an object lesson to Adventists, the, the Roman Catholic Church was going to be reformed and be the church all the way through to the end. That's why I say today, Adventists who want to fix it, you better take a look at Luther. Also, Tyndale, his second in command, his name escapes me now. Frith. He picked up the work. And he teamed up with another guy, and that really the work went out with spreading the scriptures and translating them even into more workable every day. They did. You never hear these people. But they carried that torch further. Yes, the Lord used these names, and these were people who could take the heat and the pressure, but there were all these others around them that were doing this work. Amen. Paul. And this is what's forgotten about today. And Mrs. White says about Miller that he led, God laid him in the grave early as a mercy because he would reject the Sabbath light. Mm -hmm. And it had not yet been presented to the world. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a mercy to him. So he has his ways and means that we do not question. That's why we don't judge others on that level. Absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. It's interesting that Pope Francis's call for unity uh, in his recent talk there three weeks ago, it's the very same message of unity that Gwenun Diop is presenting. Diop said, and I'm quoting from this website, the Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communions, Diop said, this unique yearly gathering is a space where distinguished leaders of Christian world communions 
engage in bilateral and multilateral dialogues, each communion sharing on their own terms about their ecclesiastical life and work as witnesses to the sovereignty of the triune God and his ultimate purpose to gather the whole world under the lordship of Christ. So that, that's the mindset, that's the mentality of Gwenundia. It's to gather the world. But folk, we are very clear, or at least we should be clear, that the world is not heading towards coming under the control of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's not where the world is tending today. Revelation 17 tells us clearly where the world is being led today. Uh, we read about the direction it's going in Revelation 17. Uh, verse 1, the Bible tells us that John would be shown the judgment of the great whore. We know from the word of God that the great whore represents the apostate papal power. Verse 2 tells us that the kings, the political leaders of our world are in unlawful connection with Rome in bringing the church and state together again. The Bible goes on down to verse 5 and says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We know that those harlot daughters represent the apostate Protestant churches that are uniting with the great whore. And then in Revelation chapter 18, we are told in verse 11 and verse 15 that the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. So the merchants of the earth weep over the fall of Babylon the Great. Verse 15 tells us that the merchants are made rich by their connection to Babylon the Great. They're made rich by her. So friends, the Bible clearly outlines that the great drive in our world today for a unity among the papacy, the leaders of the world, the political powers, the churches of the world, and the great financial powers of the earth being people like Bill Gates, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Morgan Companies, Friends, the world is uniting together today not under the lordship of Christ as Gwenun Diop has so erroneously said, but they are actually uniting under the authority and power of Holy Mother Church. And that Pope Francis is seeking to eradicate all ideological differences so that everybody comes under the authority of the Roman Catholic system. How it is that Gwenun Diop would somehow come under this is, can only be described as absolute apostasy. You know, as I listened this week to a clip that was about five minutes long, where Walter Weith 
Several years ago, I was told by Cody this morning, when he actually made those comments, where Walter Weiss said that everybody must come back into the church, that we must dissolve self-supporting ministries so that we can all be a part of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. I had to practically sit back and say to myself, so that means that I would tell everybody who has ever watched or supported Truth Triumphant that no longer support the work we're doing in buying hundreds, yea, thousands of boxes of Spirit of Prophecy books to help needy people all over the world to hear the truth for this time. Don't do that anymore. Dissolve that work and put your money towards sending Gwenoon Diop all over the world in ecumenical meetings with Pope Francis. And my summary conclusion was, that will never happen. It's shocking to me that a man of that knowledge would make such a conclusion as that. Paul? Trying to heal the wound of a daughter. But just to, re to, to reinforce what you said earlier, and I had brought this up before as a question. Now I'm going to ask it again, and I want people to think. Over the last three years, people have gone bankrupt, belly up. Many businesses have been wiped out. Uh, bad situations all over. How is it that the owner, Bayos of Amazon, in the year 2020, beginning of the year, end of 19, whatever, ordered a half a billion dollar yacht? get rich by its associate. What did he know? What did he know? Why would you do that in the face of economic ruin for, what did they say, 70% of small business in this country? Mm -hmm. He ordered a half a billion dollar yacht. And it was delivered last year, the end of last year. And very quietly, did you hear about it? Because as you pointed out in Sabbath school, look what that wonderful pope is wearing. Hmm. What's he declaring in his dress? Because popes didn't used to dress that way. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where people's minds are, but we're told we're to know the season. We're to know, if this isn't the season, then I don't know what is. These men are drunk. There's no doubt in my mind. <clears throat> no doubt, Paul. No doubt. Changing to another subject, uh, I find it fascinating that Time Magazine, here about five weeks ago now, published a special edition called Heaven and the Afterlife, in which it asserted that there is scientific evidence to support the idea of a continuing consciousness beyond death. This view is identical to the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, which holds that the soul lives on eternally, even after death. The, this philosophy is the same lie that Satan spoke in the Garden of Eden when he said, ye shall not surely die. Genesis 3 and verse 4. Time Magazine is helping prepare people to welcome the spirits of the dead by promoting the idea that the dead don't really die. Once again, the great deceiver seeks to take control of our minds. It is unfortunate that this generation listens to everything except God and his truth. In order to enhance his deception, Satan's fallen angels will pose as our deceased family and friends 
wearing robes of light and mimic the robes that the faithful will receive in the life to come. Now, I got that from Advent Messenger. But, folk, isn't it fascinating that here we are in 2024 and we're reading news clips about Pope Francis wanting to rule the world, about embracing and promoting, well, we'll get to it shortly, Sunday worship, but how Time Magazine is being used by the devil to encourage people that once you die, there's a bliss beyond. And weren't we told, friends, well, here it is right here, Time Magazine Special Edition, Heaven and the Afterlife, The Science of Continuing Consciousness. Famous cases suggesting proof of continuing consciousness. And what were the very things, what were the very things that Ellen White said would be paramount at the end of time? Who did she say would rule the world over a hundred years ago? And what did she say would be the great emphasis of evil in this world at the end of time? Friend, this was one of the prongs that Ellen White foretold would be a part of the devil's final assault on the human family. And that would be the lie that when you die, you have continuing consciousness. Cody? And this is uh, an important fabric to understand because it underlies, it, it goes through different belief systems. That just a few weeks ago, people were seeing things down in Miami. They saw possibly the Nephilim, right? So that's spiritualism at work. You have spiritualism at work in, in the New Age movements. And in all these UFO sightings, they're all interconnected. They're all the same thing. And they're all, this is the, what Mrs. White said in the Great Controversy, this is what they are all converging on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all exactly, friends, as Ellen White foretold. She said that communion with the dead would be one of the last great deceptions and anyone who understood that dead people sleep without consciousness would be protected from that horrific deception. Now Time Magazine is telling the world the devil's lie, preparing the world for visitants from demons in the form of departed loved ones. Praise God, friends. Praise God this morning for the wonderful gift of prophecy. Praise God for that amazing gift that God has given to us as a people. In other prophetic news, from January 17, about 10 days ago, Pope Francis aims to bring the world together politically, socially, and religiously at the World Economic Forum this year. Now this is what Vatican News had to say. To remind world leaders, and of course Revelation 17 identifies the world leaders as whom? What, what does the Bible call them? The kings of the earth, Dwayne, that's right. So the kings of the earth are being addressed by Pope Francis. And they're being reminded of their duty towards all humanity. Pope Francis sent a message to the World Economic Forum, which was read out on Tuesday by Peter Turkson, 
In his message, the Pope said the greatest challenge facing humanity is to ensure peaceful coexistence and integral development for everyone. This forum, he added, offers the chance for world leaders to explore innovative ways to build a better world. And he urged them to find ways to foster social cohesion, fraternity, and reconciliation among all people. Friends, what do those big three and four syllable words what is he talking about there? Social cohesion, fraternity, reconciliation. Friend, it's all about unity without any standards at all. That's what it's all about. Globalization has a profoundly moral dimension, said Pope Francis, adding that development requires a moral compass to guide discussions that shape the future of the international community. What, friends, do you think, or who do you think Pope Francis wants to be the moral compass to guide the discussions of the World Economic Forum. Who do you think the one that will be exalted? Who is Pope Francis advocating as the moral compass? Obviously, friend, it is himself. It goes on. He invited businesses and states to work together to promote far-sighted and ethically sound models of globalization. Notice, friends, we have here the whore of Revelation 17. We have Babylon the Great. We have the kings of the earth being admonished. And now we have the businessmen of the world because that's what the economic forum is all about. So he's now engaging businesses to promote these sound models of globalization. Well, friend, that's exactly what Revelation 17 and 18 was talking about. Babylon the Great, the kings of the earth, and the merchants of the earth. Authentic development must be global, shared by all nations in every part of the world, or it will regress even in areas marked hitherto by constant progress. So we see Revelation 17 unfolding right before our eyes, friends. And we saw the one prong that would be used to bring the world together through spiritualism. In Revelation 13, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So friends, when Pope Francis talks about global unity, global fraternity, he's looking at every person on this globe. Every person. Francis's vision is a world under his authority, his dominion. If that were to happen, this world would be returned to another dark age. 
this world, friends, would go on for another millennia, just like it was during the Dark Ages. That's what would happen. And that's what Pope Francis is driving for today. A world where the papacy would dominate every facet of our existence. The Bible tells us that Rome will be allowed this dominion. But praise the Lord, friends, it's not for 1260 years. It's for a very short time. Notice Revelation 17, 12 and 13. The Bible says, The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, or kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So friends, there will be a temporary unity of the kingdoms of earth with Babylon the Great. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Seeing that happening today, aren't we? The very words of Bible prophecy are being fulfilled right before our eyes. And friends, if because of the obsession in Adventism over time setting, I, I even hesitate, even though the Bible refers to a period of time. We know that one hour is about a period of two weeks. So friends, when we talk about the time period when the papacy will have control of the earth one last time, it will only be for a very short time. Very short time. Praise the Lord, friends. It's not going to be another 1,260 years. Praise the Lord. Here are a few statements from Ellen White. She says, There will be a universal bond of union, one great harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces. They shall give their power and strength to the beast. Thus is manifest the same arbitrary, oppressive power against religious liberty. Freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, as was manifest by the papacy. When in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism. Or to be waged in the last days, there will be united in opposition to God's people all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from allegiance to the law of Jehovah. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will be the great point issue. Of course, we are told as Christ was glorified on the day of Pentecost, so will he again be glorified in the closing work of the gospel when he shall prepare a people to stand the fight in the closing conflict of the controversy. So praise the Lord, friends. Ellen White has described for us exactly what we're watching today. And what a privilege, what a privilege we have to be able to ship these books all over this world. All over this world. Praise the Lord. Paul? What Seventh-day Adventist would not want to be involved in that? Oh my! I don't get it. But anyhow, you know, Bill, when you said about you didn't want to, you're, you're hesitant to set a time. Well, an hour is an hour. But you know what that reminds me of? <clears throat> and and think about it. They're going to get their union 
And then they're going to start settling in. What are the people going to start declaring the Pope? He is not a man, but God. Does that remind you of somebody in the Bible? Herod, hmm. the one that killed James. Oh, yes. What happened when he came out am amongst the people and he had his gold and his silver costume and he was glittering in the sun? What did the people say? He's not a man, he's a god, and what happened to him? I think, in my mind, that represents that two-week period with Rome and what's going to happen to Rome. The city will be cracked in three pieces. When the world bows down and starts worshiping the Pope, has got same thing as Harry, same thing. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, Paul, because in Acts chapter 12, it says, the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a god. And not of a man. And now watch what happens. Immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. Because he gave not God the glory. He was eaten of worms. And gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Amen, Paul. Amen. Absolutely. 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 You know, in light of this short period of time when the papacy united with forces of earth will have dominion. Revelation 18 says that God will put up a fight. Revelation 18, 1 to 4, the Bible says, After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And of course, at the end in verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So friends, God will have a response. God sees Rome. God sees the leaders of earth in unlawful communion with her. God sees the wealth that's being placed at her disposal. God sees the churches uniting in this heinous work. And God will have a response. Praise the Lord, friends. Praise the Lord. You know, the Sunday movement, the other arm of what Ellen White said would happen at the end of time, we read some of these statements. I got them again from uh, Brother Andy Roman's uh, Advent Messenger. Notice some headlines from just the last few weeks. Notice this. Fox News. Pastor reveals how to get back to church every Sunday. Lutherans have come out, and I've got the... Andy had the different websites where you can go see this information. The Lutherans have come out with an article, Sabbath for this year and beyond. The Catholic News Agency, an article, The Sabbath or the Lord's Day. The Reformed Churches have come out and said, why you should attend church in person this Sunday. The Evangelicals, Sabbath for All Creation. Churchleaders.com, Finding Sabbath in the Storm. <laughs> MSN News, Why Rest Should Be a Professional Priority. And Yahoo News, The Dying American Rest Ethic. The Sunday Movement, friends, is gaining momentum. Presently, efforts are underway to portray Sunday, the counterfeit Sabbath, as an essential good in our world. 
but this will lead people away from the truth that God has for this time. And God forgive David Gates, who would so pathetically, not prophetically, but pathetically, attach a time frame to this Sunday movement. We are absolutely sure that a Sunday movement is, is ripe and only getting bigger and will one day explode on the earth. But it doesn't need a time attached to it. So, tragically, tragically, God's professed people are saying some crazy and bizarre things today. So Ellen White's classic end time scenario. It's right before our eyes, isn't it? Babylon the Great, Romanism. The two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday worship. And we're watching it, friends, all over the news. Did Ellen White know what she was talking about? Did Ellen White have a gift of prophecy? We see it unfolding right before our eyes. Shame on these men. Walter Ray. Shame on this man for writing this heinous book called The White Lie. Shame on this current professor of theology at Loma Linda University, John Pauline, who has given talks where he has stated clearly that if Ellen White were alive today, she would rewrite the great controversy. Friends, how pitiful that is. How pitiful that is. And for Walter Weith to encourage us, for me to dissolve truth triumphant, and for, people to tell, for me to tell people to support a man like that over my dead body. A prophetic and a pathetic people. Idols are made of scholarship and higher education that throw away the heavenly gift of prophecy. Shame on us today, friends. Praise God for the wonderful gift, the wonderful gift of prophecy today. Because what she wrote over a hundred years ago is happening right before our eyes. May God help and use us to be, to be people of mercy to the inhabitants of this planet who are groping about in the dark, not knowing whither they're going, not knowing what the future holds. May God help and strengthen and bless us to be agents of mercy in this world to share these awesome books by Ellen White with the inhabitants of this world. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we praise you today for the abundant gifts that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for the gift of prophecy. We pray, Father, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit to get as many of these books as we can to put them into the hands of people who are starving in this world, 
people who are blind in this world and who so much are longing for light. Use us to be your agents of mercy to put those books into those people's hands. Bless each and every one of us to do that work and to be ready when rain comes in the very near future. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.